Well, hey everyone, welcome to The Countdown here at LH Online. My name is TC, I'm one of the pastors here at Lighthouse Church, and I'm joined today by another of the pastors at Lighthouse Church, our small groups pastor, Dave Corbin. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing great, TC. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you for uh, having me on. Well, you and I have been on camera a lot. We actually yeah. used to co-host a thing, and yeah. so we're, we're very comfortable together. And, sure. and Dave, I, one of the things I like to do is I like to share a little bit of behind the scenes sometimes. And I like to share nicknames that I give people. Mm. I'm one of those goofy people. I know where this nicknames. is going. Yeah. I know you do, Dave, because one time when I was preaching a sermon, I hung a nickname on you and you had no idea what I was doing. I was just messing with you. Yeah. And so I told the whole crowd that in the office, you know, that you're fantastic. So we call you Fantastic Dave, or for short, we just call you Fanny D. Yeah which I think is hilarious. I'm glad you think it's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a handful of people started using it. You know, it, it kinda, A handful? It, like a whole campus. <laughs> yeah. And well, it kind of faded a little bit. You're still in my phone as Fanny mm. D, and I'm hoping that today is the day that we bring it back up and around. Because it's a. it sounds like Sunny D, which just makes me happy. Oh, okay. Fanny D, yeah, yeah it's, uh-huh. just, it's just a great nickname. Great. I feel like we should put it on your business cards here at, at church. All right, well, you, you think about it. You think about it, and we'll, we'll okay, see. sure. Well, Dave, you know that I like to do these silly national days here yeah. as part of the countdown. Mm-hmm. And do you know, Dave, what today is? No, I don't. Can you see I'm excited about this one? I can see it all over your face, yes. That the reason is because it's National Slurpee Day. Wow. Man, now you're probably wondering, Dave, why I've, didn't I just get Slurpees on National yeah, Slurpee Day? I, I had a few questions, yeah. Well, there's a story behind that. Okay. So our communications director, Jenna, lovely young woman, I asked her if she would bring in Slurpees, and she very nicely said, yes, she would. Mm-hmm. And she came in today with iced drinks from Wawa, and I said, okay, yeah. I'm just curious why we didn't get Slurpees. And she said, but these are Slurpees. And I said, no, these are iced drinks from Wawa. Slurpees are from 7-Eleven. And she reacted with the most shock I've ever seen on a human being's face. <laughs> she had no idea Slurpees are a name brand yeah. product mm-hmm. from 7-Eleven. But you know what, Dave? Bottoms up on National Slurpee Day. Let's drink our almost Slurpees. Yeah. Mm, it's not bad. It's not, it's not bad. It's, it's not. no Slurpee, but it's not bad. Well, nothing else is a Slurpee besides a Slurpee, of course. This but is true. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's the thought that counts, or at least that's what they say. <laughs> so, Dave, please feel free to continue enjoying your delicious iced beverage while we're, while we're on the countdown. I surely will. In honor of a Slurpee. Um, but, Dave, enough with my silliness. Yeah. Uh, you know what, man? Uh, this last week, week on Friday, we had a night of worship mm. at Catonsville. Yeah. We did it last summer. We got to do it this summer. I just love having nights of worship. We actually have a couple more coming up in yeah, the near future. And you you know what? You've been on the worship team. During COVID, you were playing bass yeah. a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Is that, that's supposed to be a point of passion for you, right? Yeah, yeah. I love uh, I love music. Played in a band for a long time. And uh, lots of lots of leading worship and stuff like that. And mm. it's, a, it's a real joy to be able to participate in that. Sure. Mm. I I wish you had brought your bass and you could have like done some cool riffs while I was talking and it would have definitely made me seem cooler. But instead, when you like something I say, just take a drink of your iced drink in in honor of National Survey Day. You almost spit that out. (laughs) I did. If that happened, that'd be my favorite (laughs) new episode of all time. Yeah. Um, But Dave, hey, one other thing I wanted to talk with you about today, uh, you're obviously the small groups pastor. You're very involved in our discipleship process here at Lighthouse Mm -hmm. Church. That's a passion for you, helping people grow closer to Jesus. Another way that we invite people to get closer to Jesus and be part of our community is Growth Track. And you've been very involved in Growth Track. You've taught many of the iterations of Growth Track we've had. Um, would you do us a favor and just chat a little bit about what is Growth Track? Why do we invite people to to go through the Growth Track process with yeah. us? Yeah, yeah. Growth Track is really it's a great starting place. Like it, it's the the best place to start with just trying to figure out. Maybe, maybe you're new to church. You're trying to figure out where do I go? How do I? How can I connect here? Um, maybe you've been around for a long time and you're just trying to find what that next step step is. It's really just a great place to come learn a little bit more about the church a little bit more about who you are, mm. uh, help you discover maybe your personality, your spiritual gifts, and then really try to help tailor and fit where do you find your fit in, in the larger piece of Lighthouse Church and the church at large 
and then trying to help you find those next steps, whether that's a small group, maybe it's baptism, hmm. maybe it's getting plugged into serving on a team. Uh, there's lots of different options that come out of that, but it's this great starting place of being able to figure out how can I grow from here? Hmm. That's so good, Dave. Uh, I love how you talked about, you know, th there's different places to go because we understand church is not a conveyor belt. It's not yeah. like get on, do A, do B, do C. Sure. Everyone does the same thing. Everyone comes here and you've got your own story. You've got mm -hmm. your own journey. And we're looking to find out how can we help you to engage in what Jesus is calling you to do, who he sure. made you to be. And so I, I love that with Growth Track, we're, we're doing our best to share the story of Lighthouse, mm -hmm. to share the opportunities of how you can get plugged into what God is doing through Lighthouse. But I think my favorite part is Growth Track is also an opportunity for us to hear stories yeah, about sure. what's happening in the lives of people who are coming or how people got here. Mm -hmm. For instance, I got to read a few stories because after week one, we say, would you, would you share with us some of your stories? Mm -hmm. So I've gotten to read some stories and we hear people that are coming in who have come out of addiction or people who really have never been to church before. Mm -hmm. and, and they show up and they go, this place feels like home. It feels like a community I'd like to be a part of, but I have no idea what's next. And, yeah. and we just get to say, hey, let's walk on that journey with you. Dave, sure. are, are there any stories that have stood out to you recently? Yeah, yeah. There's been several stories I've heard of people who were, were out of state and they mm. got connected because Growth Track is on demand. You mm. can hop in and do it online at any time. They were out of state. They checked us out kind of first there and, and were able to find, hey, I can get plugged in on the online team or um, even some that started out there, then they've moved into the area and now they've gotten plugged into small groups. Mm. I know personally from the small group side, we've had people who have gone through Growth Track didn't have any clue that they were possibly gifted to be able to lead a small group, yeah, yeah. discovered that in the midst of growth track and now are leading small groups. And so th there's all sorts of uh, opportunities in there to discover things that you maybe didn't even know about yourself. Yeah, gr growth track is not a class. Like for us, it's like a trampoline. Like, yeah. like jump in and we're looking to spring you into something sure. that's gonna bring you joy, that, that's gonna benefit the whole community mm -hmm. at Lighthouse. We love that. And so you can jump on our website right now. You can check out Growth Track On Demand. It's four sessions. I think it's like a little under two hours for each yeah. of them. You're going to see John. You're going to see Sammy. You're going to see myself. Like, there's a lot of great stuff there. Yeah. So please, please, Absolutely. please jump in. We would love to have you do that. Now, we also want to invite you. We got something cool coming up this week. Last week, we had the Night of Worship at mm -hmm. Catonsville. This week, we got something else cool happening. I don't know about you, Dave. I like a good cookout. Mm. Do you? I'll take that as a I yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, who, who, who doesn't like a good cookout, Dave? I don't know, but we should find them and bring them here. Yes. <laughs> and convince them otherwise. Well, yeah. <laughs> this Friday at 6 p.m. right here at Glen Burnie uh, Lighthouse, our Celebrate Recovery Ministry mm. is going to be having a cookout because they're celebrating four, four years, years of the CR Ministry at Lighthouse. Yeah. There are, like, we talked about cool stories from Growth Track. There are so many amazing oh stories yeah. through CR. Absolutely. We love the recovery community. We love what Jesus is doing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we're going to have name brand Slurpees at that cookout or not, but uh, <laughs> if, maybe you could bring your own if you yeah. wanted to stop by wherever they sell e -Y -O -S. Slurpees. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Bring, bring or an ice drink of some ice. kind. I think that yeah. would be that would be fine too. Um, but we would love it if you're available for you to come on out. Uh, now, Dave, we're getting ready in just a few minutes to join our sanctuary and, and to continue through the Book of Mark. One of the mm -hmm. cool things about this series that we've been doing is we have something called a soap journal. I think you're familiar with that, Dave. A little bit. Because I think you helped put that whole thing together. Yeah, what sure. was your heart behind, when you were creating that, that, that soap journal, yeah. Sammy charged you, you know, kind of put some structure in there. What was yeah. your heart behind that? What do you want to see happen when people engage in this? Yeah, the, the heart really was, no matter where you are in your journey, whether maybe you've never picked up the Bible and tried to read through a whole book at a time, or maybe you've been doing this for years, just to provide a little bit of an opportunity just to go, hey, as we're spending 12 weeks going through this one book of the Bible, let's read through it together. Let's chew on it. Let's take some time with it and let mm -hmm. it kind of marinate and simmer a little bit. And so the, the SOAP reading plan just lets you take a, a small chunk of Scripture, spend some time kind of thinking on it, chewing on it, observing, and then figuring out, okay, how can I apply this today? And then you just spend some time in prayer. So it's really just to provide, hey, here's a real simple structure to help kind of get you going and so that we're all on the same page as we're going through this book together and we can all grow closer to Jesus together. Amen, man. It, you know, it, it, 
we're going to get a lot more if we, if we dive in than if we just kind of run through. And so I yeah, love that sure. resource you created. So in just a minute, we're going to have an opportunity to hear the next portion of Mark that we've been reading talked about. Yeah. Before we transition over, I just want to make sure you're aware that if you're new to Lighthouse Community, first of all, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We'd love to have you here. Tell us in the chat if you're watching live right now. Tell us where you're watching from. We'd love to hear about that. And if you have questions about Lighthouse, you can jump onto LH Chat, which is on our app and on our website down in the bottom right-hand corner. You can click the little icon. You can chat live with a real mm. person. You and I both are part of the chat yeah. team, so you might be talking with us one day. There's a whole bunch of other people on the team. We would love to answer any questions you have uh, about anything, about theology, about events, whatever it is. We would about love, Slurpees? You know, <laughs> about where to buy name brand Slurpees. I feel like Jenna should jump on LH chat and we can help her with that right yeah. away. Uh, but if you have any questions, we'd love to chat with you. And even if you're not new to Lighthouse, if you just got questions, or if you need someone to pray with you, pray for you online, jump on LH chat. We would absolutely love to do that. But right now, we're going to be moving over into our sanctuary. We're going to be joining with worship. So wherever you're at, prepare your heart and let's worship together.
yes. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children. Just, uh, I was waiting in the wings over there, and I just felt this spirit tell me, uh, someone in here, someone online, he is for you. He is for you. He is with you in your goings, in your comings. 
He is with you, He is with you, and He is for you. Amen, amen, amen. Well, good morning, Lighthouse Church. So good to be with you this morning. Thank you, worship team, as always, our amazing worship team. You guys are incredible. Love you so much. Um, you know, it takes a lot of moving parts to make Sunday mornings happen around here, both in person and online. And I just, uh, I just want to say thank you to our incredible movement team, everything, our worship team, our production team, the ushers, the online community, the guys in the parking lot. You know, you pull up, you're, you're just trying to get in. You're swearing at them and they're smiling at you, you know. Can we give a hand of applause for our movement team? They're just absolutely incredible. Love those guys. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors on staff. It's my great honor to be with you this morning. Let me give you a quick shout out before we get going here. Uh, for our men in the house, our LH men, we have an LH men's meeting this Tuesday night in this campus uh, at 6 p.m., right? 6 p.m. right here. Um, we have about 300 men show up right now. We'd love to see 400, 500 men show up for that. Um, it's been an incredible time. We got a couple more studies through the book of James. Pastor Sammy, our lead pastor, has been leading us through that. If you wanna check that out, it is a great time of edification. Um, Cause if you're a dude right now, it is hard to be a man pursuing God and it is really hard. It's impossible to do it by yourself, it's impossible. And you gotta do it with other men beside you. So please, if you have the ability, come on out for that this Tuesday night. Where you find us this weekend, uh, we are um, halfway through our summer series in the Gospel of Mark. This is week six that we find ourselves now. Perhaps if you've been on vacay, you've been away for a little bit, uh, let me catch you up. We've been working through this series some six weeks now, holistically as a church. In fact, we've provided some resources for you through this series. We've been doing what's called a SOAP journal as a church. SOAP stands for Scripture, Observe, Apply, Pray. Okay, you can check that out on our website or if you're in this room here, seat backs in front of you, there's a little bookmark, you can grab that, go through those readings. What we've been doing as a church is essentially reading a portion of scripture all week long and then on a Sunday, we will unpack a certain uh, portion of it. We've had various speakers up here throughout the course of this summer. It's been great because our lead pastor has been busy uh, penning his next book. He's been writing that all summer. We're gonna go through that here in the fall. So it is my honor to bring you uh, week six in this installment where we find ourselves is in the Gospel of Mark chapter seven. I'm gonna read a large portion of this scripture, essentially go through two miracles. I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna ask the Lord to speak and see what we can glean from him this morning, amen? Amen, all right, so here we go. Mark seven, starting in verse 24 says this, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his present secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, born of Syria, Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus went and left the vicinity of Tyre, went on through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. And he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Epha patha, which means be open. At this, the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He has even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. May God bless the reading of his word. Gracious and heavenly Father, we love you. Oh God, we love you. 
but you love us so much more. You love us so much, Lord, that you sent your son. And Jesus, you willingly came. You didn't have to, but you did. And Lord, because of that, we can now have communion with our Father, who the same spirit, Lord, that raised you from the dead dwells in us, that we confess you as Christ. So Lord Jesus, I pray for that very same Holy Spirit this morning would fill me up from the very bottoms of my feet to the top of my head. Don't let me speak a single word that is not of you. It's in your precious name we would pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so as we get into this portion of Scripture, we got to get we got to get some context here, because if you've been with us through the series of Mark, we've been telling you that Mark moves exceptionally fast, and we in our Western culture, reading this some two thousand years later, we have to slow down and pick up on some things that would just been naturally known by the reader of the day. First and foremost, let's talk about the region that Jesus now finds himself in. He finds himself in what is modern day Lebanon and Israel. This is during the Hellenistic era, the Greco-Roman Empire era. So these people, these people that are up in Lebanon and Syria, these are the ancient enemies of Israel. These people have been duking it out for some time. They're not friends, okay? This is the one region that we know about that's been told us through the Gospels. This is the one time that we know that this is the one area that Jesus has gone to outside of his own country. This is the only time he leaves the borders of Israel. Did you know that? It's interesting. John, did you know that? Did you know that? No, he didn't know that. Glad to help. Learned something today, John. Here to help. So, He goes to this region. He's actually been there one other time before. John did preach on this a couple weeks ago. This is the same region that the man who was possessed by the demon legion was in, okay? So he's now returned to this region. Gospel commentators will will opine and, and it is well underpinned that the reason he went to this region was essentially to get respite. Get a little time away. He's been very, very busy in his own country, but now he wants to take his disciples, go away, sit in the cut a little bit, do a little bit of teaching, show these guys and train these guys up so that they can know what's gonna happen as he will later depart. And the reason he needed to depart, again, is what is believed is because just prior to this in chapter seven, Jesus, his ministry is growing, and those against him, namely the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the religious of Israel, are really starting to push back against Jesus. And they just had a knockdown drag out as to what it is that makes a person holy. Jesus would go on to tell them, and it is not what goes into a man that makes a man impure, but rather what comes out of a man that makes him impure. Now, this would have been heretical in Jesus' day because these people, the religious authorities at the time, are operating underneath what we would call the purity laws. These laws were established millennia ago, going all the way back to the time of Moses and the Levitical law in the ways that the people of Israel would become pure before God and therefore go into the presence of God. Very long list of rules. We're talking like 600 plus rules rules, everything from the establishment of festivals, the establishment of the priesthood, the establishment of how you ceremonially wash yourself, keep yourself clean, what foods you can eat, what foods you cannot eat, how you handle bodily fluids, who you can talk to, handling of the dead, all these rules. Now, the reason for these rules is they were supposed to act as a visual interpretation of the separation that people have from God and all the things that would need to be done to get into the presence of God. The best analogy I've ever heard about the presence of God is it's likened to the sun. See, the sun is glorious. It's magnificent. It gives us warmth. It gives us light. It gives us life. But we can only get so close to it. The closer we get to it, the more dangerous it becomes. It becomes too hot. It becomes too pure. And it can burn us up. Same applies here to the presence of God. For these men who wanted to get into the presence of God, they had to do all these things. And it's supposed to be a visual representation of this is how far you are 
from me. The problem was they didn't take it as a visual interpretation, but an actual interpretation. They said, if I do this, 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 and this, I can get into the presence of God. And what it did ultimately showed is they walked it out in their foul thinking. Rather than show them the separation they had from God and trying to separate themselves, they began to separate themselves from other peoples. And then they found themselves prideful and haughty and felt, and felt as though they, they were the insiders and everyone else was the outsiders. They thought that they could do it themselves. They thought getting into the presence of God that it, it just... It just mattered for rules and regulations. If I do all these things, I can get into the presence of God, works-based. And if it's works-based, that means it's all a dependence on self, okay? Now, what's gonna happen here and what happens throughout the gospel of Mark is the Holy Spirit is going to inspire the penmanship of John Mark, the, the gospel writer here, who's taking the eyewitness account of the apostle Peter, giving the accounts of Jesus and showing how Jesus, in just three years of earthly ministry, deconstructed that which took 1,600 years to establish. That he's gonna say there's a different way to have a relationship with God, and it is not through rules and regulations. No longer is it if you do this, you get this. No longer is it if I follow this ritual, I get this reward. See, for Jesus, what he's going to teach is it's not a matter of procedure. It's a matter of posture. It's a matter of your, of your heart. And immediately what John Mark is going to do is gonna give us two examples how the people of Israel that were following these religious rules, were following these procedures. He's gonna parallel those against and juxtapose those against two stories of people who had a posture and how God moved. And we're gonna look at these two miracles and how they play out in the posture. And I believe the characteristics that we can glean from. We're gonna get essentially three from this woman and we'll get an additional two from the deaf man. So let, let's get started first with the woman. Off the jump, we have to realize this about the woman, this Syrian Phoenician woman that is coming to Jesus for her miracle, that there are at least four obstacles in her way in seeking out her miracle. First, there's the one we've already discussed. There's a matter of her nationality. She is a Gentile, he is a Jew. So off the break, there is a racial barrier, there is a racial tension that's happening here. Secondly, she's a woman and he's a man. Not only is she a woman, she's a Gentile woman talking to a Jewish holy man. This is going to be a, a big deal, especially in the context of ancient Israel, ancient Greco-Roman times in comparison to our modern Western thinking. This is a very patriarchal society where men are separated from women. Only women talk to their husbands. They don't associate with men. This is a massive barrier as far as it pertains to how the society itself is set up. Then there is the matter of the barrier of the disciples. The disciples themselves, though it's not unpacked here in Mark, in the Gospel of Matthew, the 15th chapter, that tells this same narrative, it says that the disciples actually were telling Jesus, send this woman away from us. We came here to spend time with you. We spent time to get away, get a little respite, get a little pause. We're the inner circle. She's the outer circle. Send her away. So there's this relational barrier that needs to be transcended. And lastly, and it's a big one, there's the barrier of Satan himself. You see, we know in this story that there is actual demonic activity going on in this little girl. That there is an enemy here, and he does not want this woman to get to Jesus. And what we can do in our modern context is oftentimes we can poo-poo the demonic. We can think, ah, there's only the physical realm, there's not the spiritual realm. No, friend, there's both. 
And while there's not a demon behind every bush, there are bushes and there are demons. And they are real. And in this narrative, we have a, a young girl who is under demonic oppression. And Satan does not want that demon cast out. But this is this woman's plight. Yet despite her plight, Despite all that she's going on, what we're gonna see is a posture of the, what we should have when we have real trouble. When we got real goings on, goings on. You know what I mean? Not the flare prayer like, Lord, give me that front row seat at the Walmart prayer. You know what I mean? Lord, 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 can I, can I please get that sale happening this Friday? No, 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 not that kind of faith. We're talking like real deal, as Sammy says, holy feel kind of faith. So let's pick up our narrative here. It says, in fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. Some translations will actually say she flung herself at his feet. Totally prostrate. I mean, embarrassing. I don't know about what your needs are, but I have never groveled before another human being. I've only seen it, and you know, and this might be dated at this point, but I remember that Office episode where Dwight is like at Michael's feet. I mean, it's uncomfortable to watch, truly. But this is what this woman's doing. She is throwing herself at this man's feet. And in that, we see the very first posture of you're in our heart, how we should go to God with a posture of our heart. It should be a heart of desperation. It should be a heart that you recognize, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm at the end of myself. There is nothing I can do. I am desperate. In my past life, flying helicopters. One of the missions we would go on is search and rescue missions. And in the back, we would have search and rescue swimmers. And as often as you would think, we would converse all the time about stories, about things they had encountered and things that they had seen. And they would all say, when you come across a drowning person, they all have a look. Doesn't matter, race, creed, color. When they're drowning, they have a look. And it is a look of absolute desperation, where they recognize there's nothing I can do. This is about to get, this, this is going to go real bad, real quick. And all they want to do is get to that swimmer. All they want to do is reach out in desperation for a hope that they can be saved. This is this woman's posture, desperate. She doesn't care what's going on. She is laser focused to get to that man. It says the woman was Greek, born in Syria, Phoenicia, and she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her. This is where we see the second posture of this woman. We see this woman, she's operating out of pure determination. She is determined to get to him. That word there, begged, that's a progressive verb. That means you do it over and over and over again. Over and over and over and over and over again. Over and over and over and over and over again. Anyone who's a parent here knows what begging's about. <laughs> mommy, 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 mama, 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 mom, 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 mama, mama. I mean, we know begging. We know begging. Been doing a lot of flying recently. Children, no begging. <laughs> Fly cross country with, with, with a one-year-old. They do not care. They do not care that you're trying to watch your in-flight movie. They want what they want, and they usually want off that plane. And they're gonna let everybody know about it. <laughs> begging and begging and begging and begging and begging. It says this woman, she begged Jesus to drive the woman out for her daughter. And so much so that the disciples say, hey, dude, can you get rid of her? Can you, can we, can we get, oh, what, can we get, these are Jesus's disciples. Just as an aside, be real careful of anyone who's following Jesus that's trying to keep you from Jesus. These men should have known. This woman needs deliverance. She needs help. 
and she's not going to let disciples or anyone else stop her from getting to his feet so she can beg for that which she desires. She knows he's the answer, and there ain't nothing that's going to keep her from getting to him. She is desperate, and she is determined. And then Jesus is going to turn around, and he's going to respond. And his response, <laughs> it's curious at first. And then as you get into it, you're like, okay, that, that's offensive at best. That might be downright cruel at worst. What he turns around and, and, and says, to her. It says, he responds with, first let children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Is that a surprising response? I'd say yes. Is that jarring? You bet. Is that challenging? Absolutely. So, some who preach this text, and I, and I get it, I get it, they'll, they'll, they'll parse out the fact that when Jesus is speaking here, the Greek terms that he's using, the Greek words that he's using, when he says dog, he is not saying like a wild animal. He's actually using the Greek word, which means kind of like your pet dog, and try to kind of soften it. But at the end of the day, I can't call my wife a mongrel, nor can I call her a mutt. That's, that's not good. Either one. I can't soften that. Any husbands in here, you can be like, that's not what I meant. That's what they don't care. <laughs> right? At the end of the day, he, he said what he said, but it, is what he said mean? No. It's not mean. Because I love what pastor and theologian Tim Keller says. He says, if you're offended rather than puzzled, you've lost the context. You've lost the context of what's happening here. So we got to slow down. And again, look at the context that's happening. And let's first look at the context of her response as Jesus tells her what he just said. What will follow after she's been so desperate and so determined is a posture that can only be described as humility. She is completely humble to his words. She is not offended. She does not say, how dare you? There is no tirade. Now that's completely foreign to us in 2021. You get on a flight to Pittsburgh, you're 45 minutes, you lose the aircraft Wi-Fi, you're about to fight somebody. <laughs> you're entitled to that. Someone calls you a name on social media, on 695, disagree, God forbid, disagree with you. Whoo. How many of us slow down and go, can you unpack that? I, I, I'm sure there's a point behind that. That's not how we respond, but that's how this, this woman's gonna respond. Why? Because first and foremost, you have to understand, there's a cultural rule and dynamic that's going on here. This woman would almost seemingly expect this. Again, she's a Gentile woman interacting with a Jewish holy man. There's an understanding that there's a separation between these to cultures. Her experience would tell her anytime that she comes into contact with a Jewish person, that they, that Jewish person would not want to interact with her at all. The fact that he's even holding discord with her, talking with her, is a step outside the normative. People want to talk about Jesus being old school. He's about as progressive as they come. He slows down to break all the rules to talk to this woman and explain some things to this woman, but there is a decorum that's going on. But her experience would tell her, and what she's un, un, unfortunately probably experienced throughout this time was a wrong representation of what Scripture said. You see, as said earlier, the nation of Israel would take God's word, and they wouldn't take it as the visual, but rather the actual interpretation, and as so, they would be prideful and haughty and think we're better than you. But when God said, listen, you are a people set apart, Israel, but do know that that's for, for a purpose, that I'm going to send the Messiah through you, first through Israel, and then to everyone else. This is why the prophet Isaiah says this. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back preserved of Israel. 
I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. See, what we tend to concentrate as that word is children's bread fed to the dog. But what we have to slow down and look at is that context where he says, first, first, let the children eat. See, this isn't a matter of denial. It's a matter of prioritization. That the salvation would first come through the Messiah, then to the nation of Israel, and then to all the nations. The statement that Jesus is making here, it's not a matter of ethnicity. It's a matter of sincerity and being tied to the word of God. This is not a matter of race. This is a matter of theology. The woman is being called a dog, not because of her nationality, but because she's under sin. And guess what? Outside of Jesus Christ, you and I, we're all dogs. And that's the gospel. See, the gospel is when you recognize I deserve to be under the table, that Jesus invites you to the table. It's when you recognize, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be first. I'm supposed to be last, that you're invited into the kingdom. It's when you recognize that he who was no sin bore all sin so that I, a sinner, could not be seen as a sinner, but as the righteousness of Christ. It's the upside down kingdom of God. That is what he's unpacking for this woman right now. And he's telling her, listen, listen, listen. The grace is you're under the table right now. You're under the table. You're not yet a child of God. But here's the trap we can fall into. This is certainly a trap. You know, hey, I'm going to speak to all my, all my ex-Catholic brethren in here. We fall into this trap. We think, oh, I'm just, I'm worthless. I, I don't deserve it. I, I'm, uh, you're self-deprecating. You're self-loathing. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm a horrible, horrible thing. You want to know, like one of the, Hardest things in the world to do is compliment a Christian. Try complimenting a Christian, especially in church. It's the most awkward conversation. Awkward conversation you'll ever have. Man, I heard you up on stage. That you, man, you can, you can play that piano. You are a good piano. I, I don't, I, well, hey, all glory to God. I don't you know, I just, well, I just, I, uh, I, uh, it's not me, it's Jesus. No, it's not. I've met Jesus. You're not him. You're just a good piano player. You want to blow someone's mind in church? When someone pays you a compliment, say thank you. They won't know what to do. Truly. Because this, this woman gets this. Because not only does she know who she is, she knows who she's talking to. And her response shows it. It says, Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon was gone. See, she she said, Lord, 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 I know, I know it's not about me. I know it's all about you and you're so big. You're so big, I know there's enough grace out there for me too. Can, can, I, can I have my portion of your grace? And he said, your daughter's well. That's faith. That's a posture. Desperation, determination, humility. Totally changes the way we relate with God. Now, quickly, Mark's going to pivot. He's going to go into our second miracle. Another, he goes from this region to another area of the unholy, unworthy Gentiles. It says this, it says, Then Jesus left that vicinity and went to Tyre, went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, into the region of the Decapolis, region of the Ten Cities. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. 
Again, remember, Jesus was here already. Mark chapter five, he, he was in this region. This is where he met the man that was possessed by legion, the demon that are many. Remember, if you remember that narrative, the, he, he was, this man was alleviated of his demon. He sat in right mind, right stead, wanted to be with Jesus. And he thought, okay, I'm gonna follow Jesus. And, and Jesus said, you can't, you can't follow me, but go tell your people about me. Obviously he did. Obviously he did, because guess what? Jesus shows back up and these men know that's the guy. That's the guy that saved that guy. Remember the, remember the nut that was like in the graveyard? No clothes and chains? That's like the mayor of the town now? That's the guy. <laughs> Listen to me. When Jesus tells you something, it's not always no. Sometimes it's not now. That man, that man that was possessed by legion said, let me, just, let me just be with you. Let me just be with you. Let me just be with you. And he said, no, you gotta go back and tell people about me. And now he turns around and he did this. And now this man is gonna experience a miracle because of that man. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I believe that that man who was once possessed by legion is now walking with Jesus every day of his life in the after. Sometimes, sometimes it's not no, it's just not. After this, he took him aside, away from the crowd, and Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue, and he looked up to heaven, and with a deep sigh said, which means be opened. So the question is, what the heck's going on here? What, what was that? Why, why, did Jesus, why did Jesus do that? I mean, he, does Jesus need to do this? I mean, this is, this is different behavior for Jesus. Just look at our previous story. This woman just came and said, heal my daughter. And he said, your daughter's well. Didn't have to be in her presence. Didn't have to do anything. Didn't have to be with her. Didn't have to hold hands, pray. He just said, she's well. Now you got Jesus sticking fingers in the air, spitting on hands, pointing at tongues. That's a different modus operandum from the last one. And yet this man does it. He doesn't understand it, but he does it. Our next posture, a posture of obedience. Doing it when you don't even understand it. Again, look at context. Slow down here. What's happening with this man? First and foremost, he's deaf and he has a speech impediment of some great kind. He's a public spectacle. So what does Jesus ta do? Takes him aside. Just me and you. I don't need to do this in front of my disciples. I don't need to do this in front of the crowds. I'm gonna do this with me and you. And then he puts his hands in his ears, and he points to his tongue. Why? Because he's communicating with him. Sign language can't hear me, but I'm going to point to you about what I'm going to do to you. Slows down, gets real compassionate with him, and boom, healed. Totally different context, but does the same thing at the end of the day, heals him. And our story concludes, it says, at this, the man's ears were open and his tongues were loosened, and he began speaking plainly. And Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. Remember, Jesus is like, I'm just trying to get a little bit of rest. Do me a favor. Everyone be cool. Chill out. I'm go take a nap. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well. They say he is, even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. They can't stop worshiping him. So when you go before God, you go before God desperate. You go before God determined. You go before God with humility. You go obediently. You go praising. 
You go with a heart full of praise. Oh, look what my God has done for me. This is the difference between the old way and the new way. The old way was, if I do rituals and if I do rules, then I'll depend on myself. The problem is that fails time and time again. You either can't get out the gate, you don't cross enough T's, you don't dot enough I's, and you're left felt totally despondent. Or perhaps worse than that, you run for a season and you do and you do and you do and you do and then you do and then you don't. And then you think, I'm not worthy, I'll never match up, and you run from God. And he went, goes and goes, finds you, and you go, okay, God, okay, God. And then you do, and then you do, and then you do, and then you do, and then you don't. And then you run from God. Or worse yet, you do, and you do, and you do, and you do. And you get more callous, you get more hard, and you get more judgmental. And then you become a whitewashed tomb. But you say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. And he goes, depart from me. I don't know who you are. We never had a relationship. Because you thought it depended on you. The difference is when you take desperation and you realize, I can't do this. But I'm determined to get to the one who can. And I'm going to get real humble before him. And I'm going to do whatever he says, no matter if I understand it or not. And I'll praise him in the storm, no matter what, because I'm dependent on God, no matter what. In that place, miracles happen. It's in that place that deliverance occurs. You know, I was getting ready for this this week. And for so many of you, I just got, I, I thank you personally. So many of you message me, email me, text me. What's going on with your wife? How's she doing? What's going on with the fight? You know, if you don't know, my wife, Nikki's been battling cancer two years. Two years she's been battling cancer. And it is not all, <laughs> it's not all mountain high. There's a lot of valley low. But if there's one thing that I encourage my wife, and I see it in my wife, is I see a dependence on God. I see a woman that's desperate for God. I see a woman that's at his feet every day, doesn't even care who's around. She humbles herself before God. She does what she's told to do, whether she understands it or not. She's praising him. She goes to bed most nights listening to scripture, even when tears running down her face. And it's my hope that that's the place where the miracle will occur. It's just, we're just setting the posture of our heart, posture of her heart. But here's the trap, team. And this is why I think Mark does this very, very strategically. I wanna, I wanna say this as a caution, is that sometimes we can make the narrative the normative. We can read one miracle and think, well, that's how Jesus operates. And we can, we can put Jesus in a box and think, if I do this, if I do this formulaic thing, this is what he's gonna do. But we just read two accounts of two vastly different people in vastly dis- different circumstances that Jesus acted vastly different with. He challenged the woman publicly. He held the man privately. This is why it's so important in the Christian life to do life together and to do life in community because your experience is different than my experience. How you experience Jesus is different than how I experience Jesus. It's always love. It's always edification. It's always becoming more like him, but it's just your walk's gonna be different than my walk. And when you read about the person of Jesus, it's like picking up a precious diamond and looking at it from various different angles. You can't look at it through one way because if you look at it through one way, then Jesus does something that's not out of that way you think you interpret him, you fall away. Why you have to be in community with brothers and sisters as you're going through life and enduring things. That's why it's so important, moms and dads. Get your 
children back in LH Kids. Get those truths deposited in them early. Middle school, high school students, go to LH students. See how your, your friends and your acquaintances are enduring life, what Jesus is doing through their life. Men, come to LH Men on Tuesday. Come to small group. Get in community. Don't happen what happens in here. Stay in here. Because God has so much more for you. He's the God of miracles. He's going to do incredible things that you either get to witness personally or get to see, walk out, and testimonies walked out that will only build your faith all the more. This God we serve is so grand and is so big, yet he wants to have a relationship with you, but it's not built on rules and regulations. It's built in community with him, community with others. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Um, Jesus, thank you that you're so relational, that you, you're, you're so specific. God, you're so individualistic. You're so in the muck and the mire with us that we can come to you, Jesus, with all of our desires, and we could recognize, Lord, we can't do it, but you can that we can beg you and you don't get annoyed about it. <laughs> that we can humble ourselves under you, not because you're some kind of draconian evil dictator, but because you are the God, the Alpha and the Omega. That you tell the mountains where to stand and the oceans you will go no further. And we can humble ourselves under you because what is man but you think of us? And Lord, we can trust you when you call us to things, even though we don't understand it. And Lord, when we see you move, as you invariably always do, we can praise you ultimately so many come to know you, confess you as Lord and Savior. Yeah,